The Prime Minister made a stunning accusation in Parliament this week, claiming that the Indian government is involved potentially in the murder of a Canadian Sikh leader. Hardeep Singh Nijur was born in 1977 in India's northern state of Punjab, the birthplace of the Sikh religion. He moved to Canada in 1997 and became a citizen in 2015. He lived in Surrey and was a known Sikh separatist leader, supporting the call for an independent Sikh homeland in the Punjab state. He was elected the head of his local temple and it was outside this temple that he was shot and killed by two masked men on June 18, 2023. In the years before his death, India had designated Niger a terrorist for his work as a Sikh separatist. In 2022, Indian officials had announced a cash reward for information that would lead to Niger's arrest, accusing him of being involved in an attack on a Hindu priest in India. In the days after his death, one of Niger's close associates said Niger told him that he had received cryptic warnings from CSIS that he was in danger. B.C. homicide investigators said the shooting was targeted, but they declined to say who was involved. In hindsight, it's clear the secret intelligence was fueling the public tensions between Trudeau and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi during the G20 summit in India. It also explains why trade talks with India were put on pause and why just days after the Prime Minister returned home, Trade Minister Mary Ng cancelled a trade mission to India. An explanation the Prime Minister made public in Parliament three months after Niger was murdered. Over the past number of weeks, Canadian security agencies have been actively pursuing credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar. Any involvement of a foreign government in the killing of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is an unacceptable violation of our sovereignty. Canadians are now waiting on the ongoing criminal investigation for more information. Richard Fadden is a former director of CSIS and a former national security advisor to past prime ministers. Uh, Richard Fadden, thanks for coming back. Appreciate Good to be with you. Uh, talk about where we are right now. The Liberal government, our allies, they keep pointing to the investigation unfolding in Canada with respect to the murder of, of Hardeep Singh Nijur and in and the alleged connection to the Indian government. What do you think is unfolding behind the scenes as they sort of take that position publicly? Well, I don't know if it's behind the scenes or not, but I don't think the criminal investigation in Canada is going to go very far. Assuming that the allegations are true, the uh, assassination would have been planned, organized and orchestrated from India. Mm. It is very clear the Mounties are not going to be welcomed in India. I think if they haven't been able to find a true path to move the investigation forward over the, cast, the course of the last couple of months, they're not going to find it now. I'm not saying they're not trying. I'm not saying they shouldn't keep trying. But I think we need to be realistic. So what's going to happen now, I think, is going to have to be at the diplomatic level. Uh, whether or not uh, we freeze some aspects of our relationship, what, uh, what parts do we freeze, what parts do we don't freeze. But I think most importantly, from my perspective anyway, is what is the government going to do with allies to make sure this doesn't happen again? What can they do there? I, I mean, this is the big challenge, um, just dealing with the murkiness of mm -hmm. something like a murder investigation like this, and then the geopolitical issues when you look at India's prominence and importance, you know, in, in, in the power balance that, that is playing out right now. I mean, what can they do with their allies to advance on this? Well, that's a very good question, because first of all, the allies are going to pursue their own interest. I mean, you know as well as I do that Mr. Biden has just been engaged in a real love fest with Modi. The last thing he needs right now is to stand up and say to Modi, my God, you're harboring a, a murderer. But I think a lot can be accomplished under the radar screen, not just with the states, with a number of other countries. I think uh, the Prime Minister and Madame Jolie are in New York today. They're probably spreading the word about mm -hmm. our view of India. They're hoping that there's going to be, you know, sort of a groundswell. And I think if we don't succeed at this, Canada itself is not going to move Modi and India very far. You know, I mean, to your point earlier, they're an important economy, most populous country. We want them as a balance to China. It's going to take a fair bit to convince them that this is a bad idea mm -hmm. and not do it again. The, the allegation the Prime Minister made in Parliament on Monday afternoon, it, it, it's based on intelligence. Do you think Canadians will ever see the hard evidence implicating potential agents of the Indian government? No. I, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, I think it may involve very, very sensitive collection methods, methodology and sources. And we have a long-standing practice in Canada not to reveal those. 
Uh, and secondly, revealing the details may well involve other states, other actors, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's going to be necessary to do it. The only way we would get to see some of this would be if there was a criminal trial in Canada. And as I've just argued, I don't think we're going to yep. see that. So Canadians, I think, are going to have to accept that in this area of foreign policy, security policy, they cannot have the same sort of access they would have for something that's based entirely in Canada. Okay, so given those restrictions, you know, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, he's calling on the Prime Minister to, in his words, come clean on the intelligence implicating the government of India. What do you make of that ask? Well, I think it's a political ask. I think he's trying to advocate a position whereby total transparency is desirable in all cases, at least for Parliament, if not for the, pu the public. But this is not the American system. We don't clear parliamentarians as a matter of course. I happen to think that we should, but that's a, that's a yeah. debate for another day. Uh, so I don't think it's going to happen. I think it would uh, also harm us with our allies if all of a sudden, because of domestic political pressure, we start giving out secrets. How confident do you think Justin Trudeau and his government must be in the accuracy of this intelligence if they were willing to raise it directly with Prime Minister Modi and then announce it to the world in the House of Commons? I think all governments, and this one in particular, are initially and in instinctively very, very uh, worried about the value of operational intelligence that causes them to take action. The threshold for the Trudeau government, I think, is pretty high. Mm. So if they decided to do something, they would have questioned things up and down the yin yang many, many times. So I think they would have been fairly confident because there's a real downside. I mean, and you don't have to be Henry Kissinger to figure out that doing this has downsides. Our relations with India, the confusion we're sowing with our allies, uh, the difficulties he's going to have in Parliament. So I think if he decided to do this, it was because the intelligence provided by CSIS, CSE, the Mounties, or whomever would have to be pretty solid. Yeah, but Bob Ray was on the show last night, the ambassador mm -hmm. to the UN, saying there's no upside for Canada. Absolutely. Doing this. If you look at a logic, it's just yep. create a mess of trouble. Mm. But just to go back to the, why they must feel confident in this, I mean, you've been a national security advisor, you've run CSIS. David Vigneault and, and Jody Thomas were sent to India mm -hmm. multiple times, we're now being told, to speak with people there. I mean, What's the kind of threshold to deploy those officials on a mission like that? It's a pretty high threshold, uh, in particular with a country like India, which is very defensive. You know, they really are not the most... The, the intelligence community there is very good from their perspective, but they're not the easiest group of people to deal with, I think it's fair to say. So the threshold would have, been, have to be pretty good, particularly when you send an NSA who's an agent of the prime minister. You don't do this lightly. So we now have a, a, a public inquiry uh, that, that started, the mandate for mm -hmm. Justice Dogg started on the same day the Prime Minister mm -hmm. uh, made this announcement. This is the deal with elections, but what has happened here and what is going on here seems to go certainly beyond that mandate. I mean, we're talking about an extrajudicial murder of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil. What kind of process does this necessitate? beyond the police investigation, or does it necessitate? Well, I think it does. I would argue that uh, the last thing that Justice Hogue should do is involve herself in this right now. There are such a mm -hmm. thing as too many cooks in the kitchen, right. and she should stay away from this. She has a pretty broad mandate to begin with, and I think she should, I think she should stick to it. I think if this particular case proves anything, it's that foreign interference in Canada is serious. It's not limited to the Chinese and the Russians. And we have to come to grips with it. I don't know if it's another commission of inquiry. I don't know if it's the government taking a firmer stand on all these things. I don't know if it's additional resources to the security agencies. I don't know if it's involving the provinces. But it seems that every month there's a further indication, either directly in the media or in the media or from the diaspora, that this is a serious issue. Uh, and I think governments, plural, have done a bunch of things to help on this front. But clearly it's not enough. We need to find a way of coming to grips with this for a couple of reasons. One, diaspora. Uh, two, the message we send to our allies. And I think another real issue is, you know, we're, we're now going to be faced with a bunch of Canadians who are going to become very prejudiced against Sikhs and Indians because of this. We, we have a real problem in this country right now, I think, with entire groups of people being sort of cast in a negative vein with ill information being the basis. Well, in that backdrop, we, we saw the national, one of the national Muslim organizations and the World Sikh Organization of Canada calling for protection. Uh, what, realistically, given the size of the populations and, and the scope, the complexity of the, of the politics, what can a government do to offer protection to people who might feel at risk right now? I think it's very limited. I mean, one of the things I remember from my time at CSIS is most 
most thread, uh, bits of thread information that we get are general. Mm -hmm. You don't get on a piece of paper, you know, I'm going to use a bomb at this place at this time. So neither the police nor the nor CSIS is able to deal with generalized threats. If there's a specific threat, I hope, the de I hope they deal with it. Um, so I think one of the things we're going to have to do as a country is we're going to have to start viewing our relations with the diaspora as a transactional issue. We're going to have to develop more basic, holistic relationships with these groups of people so that we can understand better the comings and goings. But right now, I think it's fair to say that most relationships, not just with the Indian diaspora, but more generally, are transactional. And they happen to, uh, they sort of manifest themselves when there's a problem. Uh, I think we have to get beneath the surface of this and start dealing with it. I think one of the issues it raises, too, is, you know, when you emigrate to Canada, you know, it's a free country, you can do whatever the heck you want as long as it's yep. within the law. Should you be bringing the problems of your homeland here? I mean... They may just follow you here. They may follow you here, but I think it's worthy of a conversation. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with people advocating for Khalistan if they stay within the law. But clearly there have been instances where the government of India has probably cause for complaint. The fallout continues from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's stunning accusation that the Indian government may have been involved in the murder of a Canadian citizen. India has issued a new travel advisory warning its citizens of, quote, politically condoned hate crimes and violence in Canada. Here in Ottawa, the NDP is calling for India to be a part of the foreign interference inquiry. We don't need to add India into the inquiry because in the terms of reference, it talks about Russia, China, other state and non-state actors. It's important to say uh, that the inquiry is into foreign interference in democratic institutions or federal democratic processes. The minister's comments there are backed up by the Privy Council office. In a statement, a spokesperson said, as it relates to Commissioner Ogg's mandate, the terms of reference of the public inquiry provide her with the ability to examine and assess interference by China, Russia, and other foreign states or non-state actors in order to confirm the integrity of the 43rd and 44th general elections. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh joins me now. Mr. Singh, it's good to speak with you again. Thank you. Good to speak with you. I want to start with this letter that you sent to Justice Ogg, who, who started her mandate on the day the Prime Minister made this allegation in the House of Commons. You're asking her to include an examination of India's foreign interference in Canada as part of the public inquiry. Isn't what we're talking about here the murder of a Canadian citizen outside of that mandate? Uh, well, first of all, the, the murder of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil... Uh, by a foreign government, if that's if that's the intelligence that we have, uh, that the prime minister shared, it is is a horrible and a serious violation of our sovereignty. But it makes it very clear what we've long known. We've heard anecdotally that there is clear interference from India in Canada. We had put forward a motion that included not just China but Russia, Iran, and India. Clearly, given this serious incident, and that. The involvement in Canada is so much so that there's right. intelligence linking Canada or linking India to a murder in Canada. We think that it rises to the level now that that, that interference should be expressly included in the mandate. Right, because the, the terms of reference which your party helped negotiate, Peter Julian, your House leader, was your representative on this, uh, calls on her to examine and assess interference by China, Russia, and other foreign states or non-state actors to assess any impacts on the 43rd and 44th general elections, so 2019 and 2021. This particular case, the murder of Mr. Niger, this is, you're not asking her to look into this, are you? You just want her to look at India's role in those elections? What specifically do you want her to do in connection to the murder? Because your, your letter referenced it specifically. Well, well given that and, and the mandate of the, of the public inquiry to look at foreign interference, we're saying that this is so serious and so glaring that it requires the, the commissioner to assess this incident specifically, but sp but more clearly and more specifically, general Indian government interference in Canada. That, that it's so serious that it requires that. Well, her mandate seems to allow her to, to look yep. at the actions of the government of India, but with a criminal investigation and, and, you know, the global diplomatic issues that have been caused by this, uh, you know, and the allegations based on intelligence, is it appropriate for her to start looking into this specific incident when the police and, and, and the intelligence agencies are already doing it? Well, she, she needs to include uh, India in her mandate, and the extent or the breadth or the specificity of that I leave to the commissioner, of course. My recommendation is, given this incident, it makes it clear that India should be included in foreign interference, 
and then I, of course, leave it to the, in, the commission to remain independent okay. in terms of how she conducts that. But I reference something as serious as this that highlights how important it is for, for the commissioner to then investigate and where that investigation takes her. Uh, that is up to the to the commissioner, the judge herself. Okay, so if she uh, chooses not to investigate this specific incident, because it all happened after the election, it's not directly related to election interference per se, though a, quite a serious example of alleged foreign interference, you would be okay if she exercises her judgment not to dig into this specific incident. Yeah, I respect the independence right. of the commissioner, and the commissioner is going to make those decisions. There are separate paths where I'm going to ensure that every step is taken to investigate this matter through what the Prime Minister has alluded to through potentially the justice system, that has to happen right. uh, either way. Th this case, it, it, it's raised a lot of serious questions about public safety in Canada, uh, in particular for sick Canadians. You're a prominent uh, sick Canadian. Do you have any concerns about your own safety? Are you taking any extra precautions because of all of this? Uh, I am concerned uh, about myself, but, but I'm also a very public figure. I do have access to certain resources for security. And so I'm more, though, concerned about other people. I'm concerned about so many activists, not just from the Sikh community, but of course from the Sikh community, who have been critical of the many human rights violations, systemic abuse of power of this particular uh, administration in, in India, the Modi administration, which is, which is rife with human rights violations. A and also historically, uh, the Indian government has got that bad uh, track record, a horrific track record. So I'm concerned about what that means for a lot of people who've raised voices, mm -hmm. been concerned, maybe supported in the farmers' protest, uh, tweeted out support, what it means for them, what it means for their family. Canada's issued a travel advisory to go to India. I, I agree. I think it is. And it has been very dangerous for anyone that's critical of the government to travel there. We've always known that, but hearing the Prime Minister's words, and now seeing that official travel. Well, that uh, was weather and, and health related. It wasn't necessarily related to this specific thing. It was a PHEC update having to do with uh, potential weather and disease outbreaks. I know there were some cautions when the unrest was happening in various parts of India, but, but it does speak to the complicated situation we're in now. And, and, and elite people are calling out for extra protection for diaspora communities. I mean, wh what realistically can the government do on that, given the number of people and, and the complexity of the issue? There are specific threats that have been raised, uh, threats to life, and in those specific incidences, like Mr. Niger, and information has come out that he was mm -hmm. warned a number of times of, of a very imminent and real threat to his life. I spoke to his son, who was also in those briefings when I was, was aware. In those cases, the, the federal government should be doing everything possible to keep those people safe, to provide them with the protection and supports that they need. Do you think you know enough? Do you think Canadians know enough uh, about what prompted the Prime Minister to do this? I mean, it's a, an extraordinary move, what he did in, in Parliament on Monday, and the fact that they sent the head of CSIS and the National Security Advisor to India raises directly with Modi, suggests to the uninformed here that they have a high level of confidence in this. Do you think you know enough? Do you think Canadians know enough? And, and is there more we can see, do you think? I don't think we know enough right now, and I think uh, I do trust the, the work of our, of our intelligence forces, our, our security forces, uh, and our security agencies. I trust their work and that the Prime Minister has made an assessment that it is so serious that it requires folks knowing about it. I now want to see justice unfold. I want to see the investigation continue. I, I hope to see a justice proceeding move forward. And really, I will not stop to, to ensure that, that there is justice in this matter. This is a very serious attack on the sovereignty of our nation, and I'm gonna do everything I can in my power to ad advance justice in this case. There's, there's a lot of people in the national security area, including people like Richard Fadden, the former head of CSIS, who just don't think we're ever gonna get uh, a criminal prosecution out of this, because if it is as it has been laid out, figure the gunmen are long gone, you're probably not gonna get cooperation from India as has been requested. Certainly, that's the early response we're getting from the Indian government. How optimistic are you that justice can be done and answers can be given on that? Uh, I'm going to continue to use every, every tool I have to push for it. Uh, I, I don't want to presuppose an outcome. I want to focus on what I can do. And what I'm letting the community know is that given what we've heard, uh, as a leader of an opposition party, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we can move this forward.